you try it. Okay, and the last part, we'll be back to the stage for another five minutes. Let's start from Professor Torio and then Professor Heng and then Professor Embong, please. So I Magandang umaga sa inyo. Um, first, before I'd like to, before I start on my presentation, I'd like to first thank uh, Professor Consor Chai, uh, who was res responsible for bringing here. He was our distinguished plenary speaker in the 2012 APSA conference in Manila. And then, and of course, to Professor Chayan, who single-handedly mobilized this very successful conference and his secretariat that's very helpful in ma uh, making our life here very comfortable and very nice. So congratulations, Professor Chayan. And uh, it's also nice to see friends whom we've been uh, seeing each other for the last 20 years or so, Professor Abdichat, all the other people. So thank you very much. So uh, I'd like to thank Professor Rick for paving the for opening the door for discussion about poverty and equality. So my presentation is about urban transitions, poverty and equality and development in Asia and the political economic conversations. Uh, for a long while, uh, urbanization, uh, before I go that, I'd like to pose to you what uh, the world system theorist more than 20 years ago said that I would phrase the intellectual questions of our time with the moral questions of our time. Why is there hunger amidst plenty? Why is poverty against prosperity? Why do many who are afflicted do not rise up against the few who are privileged and smite them? But the postmodernist question also asks, how are systems of domination and oppression caught up in the big knowledge systems, the meta-narratives that dominate our imagination and our world of decisions and actions, and in turn construct reinforce and recast and reconfigure that system? How can we liberate ourselves from the systems creatively and productively? So let me look at some of the current and recurrent developments in the region. We are familiar with the globalization's impacts that Professor Rick basically uh, talked very much about, and also the contestations of our state making and projects. Uh, we see there uh, in across Southeast Asia, the contestations of legitimacy of the government and the current system of governance and the development strategies that they are promoting. And we all know about the development dilemma, the growth and expansion amid poverty and equality, exclusion amid, amidst limited inclusion, and the risk and insecurity. Um, these are some of the, I'd say, key messages that I'd like to been very uh, I'd like to talk this morning, and I think it's been very echoed, echoed in this panel and by Professor Rick that why, despite rapid economic growth and expansion in the Asian region, poverty in Ecuador continues to rise. Poverty incidents increase in slum poverty, the Gini coefficients. And also, I'd like to talk at some of the social, political, economic contestations that's happening across the region and what can sociology can offer for analysis and action. Do we have any, or what are some of um, innovations in knowledge systems and action that we've been uh, propelled on. And also, you see some transitions in the region, the governance transition, democracy and decentralization, and also some propositions and the social ecological transitions that are happening in our midst. And I'd like to uh, tell you, by, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Happy Planet Index, and then uh, Ulrich Beck talks about the risk society that we're talking and is offering about ecological cosmopolitanism, and I think here in the region we have plenty of alternative movements towards that. So, in a sense, we talk about the rapid, or I'll talk about the rapid urbanization and the globalization of the economy and the poverty and equality. And also, I think the rapid urbanization and the growth is also creating rising pressures and expectations, and we should ask who gains and benefits in this process. And I think Professor Ray can talk to you a lot about who, who pays for it and who gains and the contestations. And I think we have to think about proactive rethinking of our current dominance knowledge systems, the government systems and development models. Uh, you can see when you talk about urban transition, Asia for a long while has been predominantly rural and then but the last 50 years or last 20 years, this is rapid um, urbanization. You can see there uh, that Asia as, you know, um, Europe and America has finished and Asia is very much 
rapidly following the um, the pattern experienced earlier by your organization. You can see the in the ASEAN region uh, the urbanization process. You can see Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, and Malaysia. You can see that Asia basically is one of the most dynamic economies in the world, and also it's associated with the growth of the population in cities. Um, and then also in terms, if you look at some figures about the consequences of Asia's urbanization and globalization, you'll see that, um, as Professor Rigg is saying, that we have reduced poverty, but also, as of 2013, Asia accounts 60% uh, 60 of the world's uh, slum population, 600 million of the 1 billion. Uh, in 2010, um, you'll see that, you know, we have the slum, the slum dwellers are quite ex uh, increasing in Asia. You can see there in terms of Asian urbanization, the growth in poverty by, by countries. Um, so poverty incidence has reduced, but increased in absolute number in cities. And um, you see that? And so we see that we, uh, if, if you look at Professor Rick's uh, figures, yes, we have reduced the poverty, but in absolute numbers, it's growing in mega cities. Uh, Asia has 17 of the mega cities in 2023. But uh, as you can see also, as it, um, the global monitoring report of 2013 shows that urban poverty remains the South Asian problem, which means to say that South Asia is doing better, but not as much. So you can see this in terms of, you know, we've seen that in Professor Riggs from Southern That, that Asia accounts for 600 million of the world's 1 billion slum population as of 2013. Uh, and you can see also about the working poor in Asia. Uh, East Asia is not, uh, is doing quite well compared to the South Asia. And we also think in terms of city size and the urban poverty. Uh, you can see this in three countries. And then you can see here you, the world, if you look at the health on the left side, and you look at the incomes on the right side, you will see that Japan is doing quite well, and China is somewhere in the middle, and you'd see Thailand and in the middle and the left. So worldwide, we are somewhere in the middle, and um, the aim really is should be, we should have more yes, change. You'll also see in terms of health, in terms of expect life expectancy at birth, you'd see that Japan is doing quite well, China's in the middle, India is really coming down. Our aim should really should be for us to be most up here on the right side. And you'd see this national the divide in terms of connectedness to the internet. You could see there that uh, Southeast Asia in red is the doing quite well compared to Africa. Um, you'd see there in terms of the world cities, you'd see Bangkok there and Kuala Lumpur and Singapore. So it's, we're not doing badly in terms of the global cities. We're part of the global hub of economic growth. But in terms of inequality, in terms of Gini coefficient, you'd see that Southeast Asia has a medium inequality. You can see there from the, you can see that the northern countries in Europe and Europe are doing pretty well, while Africa and Latin America and it's not doing so well. Uh, in Southeast Asia, Malaysia has the highest Gini coefficient, um, highly unequal, and you have the Philippines next to Malaysia, then you have Thailand and Singapore. Um, actually, compared to the United States, you know, we're more high, highly unequal. And then, of course, looking at the socioeconomic, one other complicating thing really is that this region is highly uh, vulnerable to climate changes, to climate vulnerability. You can see there in terms of red that Philippines, 
sailor who have something in common, a flood, and they will drown. And you can see in terms of the cause of disasters worldwide. So while the region is rapidly expanding economically, it's also a recipient of other um, environmental disasters. You can see there in terms of the costs of disaster impacts between the last two to 12 years. And also, the region also has very much uh, provided a very vibrant, I'd say, discussions about democracy and, the, and, um, and, and power and equality. You can see this in Manila and Bangkok and Jakarta and so forth. So there are a lot of contestations of redistribution of public goods and governance and so forth. You can see this in the Istanbul protests uh, last year. The Bangkok protests of 2000, 2010 to 2013 Bangkok protests, 2013-14. Kind of interesting, no, the colors. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, in, in these uh, cities, you know, we have practiced citizenship among nation states. The demand for inclusive national membership is massively unequal in terms of distributing rights. And there are uh, NGOs and CEOs are demanding for legalization of social rights. And, of course, the poverty and kind of environment and disaster risk and sustainability. You can see this in the Philippine cities, the social spatial inequalities. And this is uh, an interesting proposal based by the Happy Life um, Index by the New Economics Foundation. That the aim really is to look to be on the green side. If the top one there is Costa Rica. Costa Rica has the highest life expectancy, higher than the United States, and it has committed to renewable resource, renewable resource energy by 80 to 90 percent already. So I, we always say in the Philippines, if a poor country or a not so rich country like that can do that, can commit to reducing their emissions to green energy, how come the rest of the countries that are rapidly expanding, uh, growing so much, don't even want to commit to uh, you know, reducing their carbon footprint or water footprint for that matter. And so you can also, in terms of why say that all this uh, uh, context that we're living now, a context of growth, a context of equality, it demands that we must rethink and reframe our lifestyle uh, and, the, and also to rethink our contribution to the global ecological footprint and the biocapacity of the earth. The, the idea really is to have their biocapacity go higher, not lower. And of course, uh, one of some of the proposals in terms of reframing our discourses and practices that we should move towards the age of sustainable development discourses. And Jeffrey Sachs, who's incidentally an economist, and he even said, how come sociologists are not there? It's the economists who are questioning all these notions about development. And he says that a method of helping to save the world sustainable development, it carries a holistic approach to human well-being so one that really focus on well-being rather than growth and income and wealth. And also that basically it does not sacrifice the, the connectedness and strong bonds of peoples and also the sustainable environment. And we also in terms of we should look towards in terms of really reconfiguring our, our production exchange processes such that it reduces risk and it builds resilience. So I like very much uh, Professor Hertigawa's proposal the other day about community resilience, that uh, building globally there of sustainable development is very abstract, but you have to think in terms of everyday lifestyles, how, how we manage our institutions, how we manage our societies, even our decisions. Uh, I, I like Professor Rick's you know, discussion about uh, the Singaporean woman saying, if I, am, if I have to be equal in treatment or if I have to be inclusive, it sacrifices my weekend. And here, this is a proposal that by the New Economics Foundation on, it, on how do we should measure our progress. We should not measure our progress in terms of economic growth only, but really in terms of how we're using ecological resources and how it's contributing to the well-being of people. And so let me conclude with my comments that uh, remembering Wallerstein's intellectual and moral questions and the postmodernist questions, I think it pushes us to uncover radically the theoretical, empirical underpinnings of the socioeconomic models of development and also of how we organize our own groups and societies and also the cultures that inform our action, starting, I think, with our ideas that inform our consumption, production, and exchange of ideas and products. 
And Ulrike is very, um, has proposed what he calls ecological cosmopolitanism. And also I presented to you earlier that we should think of not only economic transitions or urban transitions, but also the ecological transitions that are happening on this. And that we should look towards in terms of uh, pushing for an age of sustainable development. And we should look in terms of deep decarbonization pathways in our development models. We should think in terms of more creative options for social inclusion. Uh, I get tired of listening to all these social e inclusion moves in the UN and things, but it really doesn't you know, move much for me. And also we should opt for more when we make decisions in our everyday life, as decision makers, as leaders in our institutions, we should think in terms of that we must build towards inclusive and resilient, socially connected people not just you know, growth and expansion and more money, more resources, but really have to look at the consequences of this in terms of what is the meaning of this for the other people who are not in the decision-making process. And we have to look at um, alternative ecological environmental movements in Asia. Uh, thank you for giving Sutira and Chanya giving. Thank you for giving me the chance to share this. Some, shall I say, a bit of a dream. Uh, of, uh, now my, my talk is a bit, a bit different because I was talking essentially about building ASEAN culture. And uh, in the process of uh, doing the paper, I realized that the, there are some implications for nation building or now the outline will be, I will be, be touching on five points. First, uh, <coughs> a short list of ideas to advance ASEAN community. And then uh, beside idea, more importantly, will be the activities of uh, advancing ASEAN community. And then we reflect on community building, nation building. Regionalism as ASEAN in the context of globalization. And we talk about what are the potential contributions of ASEAN. Now, this is a short list. I, this list can surely be expanded. Uh, as we all know, ASEAN countries is a case of diversity. I don't have to go into it. Uh, and then the next thing I want to talk about. So the the essence of diversity can be a source of growth. But quite often, the optimist or the forward-looking perspective is to see the, the, as an endowment of nature, as an endowment of culture, and it's a tremendous resource to build a society. And the, my concept of uh, unity is that it is a unity without uniformity. Uh, it's a diversity without aggregation. And then it is a unity based on the understanding that differences are a source of cultural, sorry, it's a cultural resource for building a society. I don't need to talk about social justice, it's a concept well known among all of you. And if we look around the ASEAN uh, countries, we find that actually the people in one ASEAN country actually know very little about their neighbors. Take the case of Singapore. I was working in Singapore for eight years. To my surprise, the Singaporeans know more about Europe than about Thailand or, or about the Philippines. So the, this is something that we need to do about. Second is about the European Union. 
Now, in spite of all the problems associated with the euro crisis, I think the European Union is an achievement in, I would dare to say, the whole human history. At least for one thing for sure, they have solved the problem of narrow nationalism. It is very unlikely to have a situation where France will be fighting a war against Germany. And it was so in this regard. It is pretty, pretty unlikely now. Whereas in Southeast Asia, we know the problems, and all the more so in East Asia. So there's something for us to learn from European Union. And of course, the case of building community uh, implies the notion of common destiny. Now, what is more challenging is to translate this into action. And I will suggest that we can consider the following. Peace building. The peace building has uh, two aspects here. One is, as we all know, East Asia can be a theater of war. I don't have to quote examples. And uh, as we all know, the problems between China and Japan and the Straits of uh, Taiwan. So the, the, the good thing about ASEAN is that ASEAN is being sort of being, being courted by all these major powers. And ASEAN can play a role. The, as to how it's going to be done, I think there's a body of literature on this. Uh, this armament, this is something that ASEAN countries have a bad record. In the past 10 years, the, budget, the defense budget for military procurement has been increasing rapidly. And the, it is projected that by the year, in two years' time, the defense budget of ASEAN countries combined will be 40 billion US dollars. Environment protection, I think Professor Riggs has mentioned that very properly. The, 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 uh, and I think you have put down the point too, John. Uh, I, and uh, again, I don't need to talk about protected rights of migrant work, workers. Uh, Professor Rick has actually done the, done the, uh, done the good job. <laughs> now, observer to national elections. Take the case of a recent election in Malaysia. The Kuala Lumpur government were very hesitant about observers from other countries, but it is very difficult for Malaysia to deny the participation or the inviting observers from the ASEAN countries for various reasons, for various political reasons. So the, this is one thing that the, the ASEAN countries can do. And the, the here, Again, uh, sorry, I, I refer again to the work of uh, Professor Rick. The, the, in the spirit of taking care of your migrant workers, uh, when you're here, what about sending volunteers out to the neighboring countries? Again, the example of Singapore. Singapore actually has a surplus of highly trained graduates, and many of them are actually not doing the work that they are trained to do. I, have observed that in Singapore, there are engineers working in Singapore, uh, estate agents selling ice cream, selling uh, the, the, uh, and here I feel very delighted to give this as an example of the Association of Professional Bodies, where the, this is a forum for ASEAN people to interact and we can extend it besides uh, academic associations, the professional associations, and so on. Now, what I want to point out here is the importance of school textbooks to include sections on uh, neighboring Asian countries so that we know more about each other. I mean, it is to me a, a, a strange uh, kind of a uh, uh, colon legacy that we know more about European European countries than or about America than about uh, the ASEAN countries. Uh, listening to the talk by the keynote speaker of yesterday, uh, uh, if I pronounce the name correctly, uh, Don Seng Ro. I'm reminded that her ideas actually are all very applicable to na 
application building and also very applicable to community building. To me, it's a, a kind of a interesting phenomenon that things, ideas that are useful for community building are also, are, are, they are very similar. And what is even more important is that community building cannot be a success when the community members are not at peace with themselves. Uh, this one I quickly go in, go through. ASEAN relations with leading powers, inter-ASEAN relations, and most importantly, the internal conditions of the countries. If a country is at peace with itself, then there are more chances of community building. If Burma is a failed state, we have a problem. And one thing is that ASEAN countries, the ASEAN states are actually weak states, except perhaps Singapore, and they are even weaker nations. What we observe critically, if you look at the history of the so-called nation building in, in uh, ASEAN countries, they are actually building the state. Their main focus is building the state rather than building the nation. They pay less attention to building nation than building the state. and blah, 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 as I mentioned. But one thing that I want to pass on it to, to sort of argue very strongly that in the process of building nation, in the process of community building, let's think, about, think of it in the context of that we are actually building an ASEAN, uh, sorry, an Asian civilization. And if we make a success in building Asian civilization, it is a contribution to world civilization. I want to raise it to the level that actually we are, uh, let's be inspired that we are actually building a civilization. Thank you. Morning, Madam Chair, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen. I think the panelists are freezing here, and I'm not sure. I think the audience too are freezing, and I do not know when we will get frozen. But but I think the ideas have been floating around from the keynote speaker, Professor Johnson Rigg, and from the the earlier two panelists. I think are, are fairly hot. Uh, ideas on the move, ideas that have potential for change and transformation for, for our region and uh, coming from APSA conference, I think this is a very good thing. I, what I'm going to do here within the 15 minutes constraint that uh, is given, uh, uneven develop, development, change and inequality in South Asia, the inequality part and development part has been dealt with very effectively, eloquently by Professor Rick and also by Professor Emma. Uh, Professor Heng has talked about ASEAN community and all that. So I'm going just to touch on those that perhaps, that there's not much left yet, yet but <laughs> I'll try just to, to add in a few more things. What I'm trying to do is to offer some reflections on the need for a sociology of Southeast Asia and to contribute to that debate that given all these kind of problems that we talk about, what then sociology, sociology and sociologists on Southeast Asia and from Southeast Asia can do to analyze and advance knowledge at the same time to advance society forward. Now, why sociology of Southeast Asia? I think we roughly know about it. A big region, a huge historical region, rich in culture. ASEAN has already becoming a, a kind of block and there is also a regional perspective from ASEAN vis-a-vis -vis the world and also of itself. So, I mean, these are the factors which I think makes it just a justification for us to have a sociology of Southeast Asia. Um, well, knowledge construction of Southeast Asia, we, you know, a lot of things have been uh, studied on Southeast Asia in various ways. And Southeast Asian studies has evolved as a very rich corpus of knowledge through academic programs in departments and centers, universities, through journals, through books, conferences like this, and so on and so forth. 
and a number of social science concepts that have become part and parcel of, uh, of the knowledge have emerged from the study of this region. For example, concept of plural society by Furnival, dual economy by Berker, a culture involution by Gertz, moral economy and social resistance by Scott and so on and so forth. And it's very important that new concepts, I think, are emerging for also from this region out of uh, the studies that have been taking place. <coughs> Nevertheless, there are certain gaps from the perspective of sociology of Southeast Asia uh, <coughs> that have been developed so far that works on the region have tended to be focused on nation states and communities within nation states rather than cross-regional comparative perspective, cross-regional comparative studies. And what we have heard today from the, and also yesterday have been fairly, it's very good, very cross-comparative regional perspective and so on, but many of the studies have been very much confined within the borders of the nation states. And so much so leading to some of us not knowing our neighbors as uh, Professor Heng just mentioned just now. And because of this, this kind of situation has led to some scholars to regard the sociology of Southeast Asia or the social science of Southeast Asia as underdeveloped. And this is a quote from Victor King, uh, which was quoted by, by uh, Wazawi in his presentation yesterday. Nevertheless, there have been attempts by various scholars on Southeast Asia to look at Southeast Asia as a whole, and if we look at it historically, there are studies by 1972, by Sayosina Latas on modernization and social change. Evers, 1973, modernization in Southeast Asia. And uh, lately, on um, political science as one volume, Southeast Asia in political science, theory, region, and quantitative analysis by Eric Kuhonta, Slater, and Kuang Wu, which is very interesting and which argues that Southeast Asian political studies have made important contributions to theory building in comparative politics and so on. And also, lately, there has been a book by Victor King on the sociology of Southeast Asia. Perhaps, this, perhaps this, so far, this is the only single authored book on the South, sociology of Southeast Asia, uh, published in 2008, which tries to fill the gap in social science knowledge of Southeast Asia with its comprehensive and integrated treatment of the important sociological and political economy writings on the region using case studies. Okay. Um, now, the second, well, the third part of my presentation tries to answer the question why the sociology of Southeast Asia has been underdeveloped. Now, Victor King gives two reasons. One is due to perspective, that is what he calls the dominance of positivist and empiricist traditions, especially in the 1990s, and the and the neglect of the fact that Southeast Asia is part and parcel of the global economy dominated by capitalism, which was discussed already today. And secondly, according to him, the difficulty in access to data in some countries of Southeast Asia for various reasons. Now, I think these two arguments are true. Nevertheless, I would like to add a few more arguments to explain why the sociology of Southeast Asia has been somewhat underdeveloped. I think in the last 20 years or so, especially since the rise of neoliberal globalization and market-driven managerialism, there has been a general decline of social science and sociology as university disciplines. They are still there, but in comparative terms, the strength and influence of sociology and social science have been on the decline, overtaken by science and technology and market-driven management disciplines. I think that's one. Second, with the state and universities being captured by market demands, Idealism has somewhat declined, and there's more emphasis on pragmatism. Third, along with the decline, we also do not have many sociologists in, in the region who adopt long-range historical comparative regional perspectives. And fourth, many scholars with, work within the framework of nation states along the lines of methodological nationalism. I, I, I think these are some of the reasons why we, we find that the sociology or the social science of South Asia has not really been evolving uh, as the way that we would like it to be. <coughs> so what we have to do now, and I think the AFSA conference is the right platform for this, is to re rekindle the interest and passion and idealism to reinvigorate social science and sociology, including the sociology of Southeast Asia, and the need to promote cross-border flows of knowledge within the region and through various mechanisms, 
and that uh, issues of great sociological interest are plenty in the region and pressing within the region for scholars to interrogate and to investigate. I think we have heard all the, the, the this morning and also the yesterday and the last two uh, speakers before me also have raised the questions. Now what I want to do is to highlight certain selected issues and see the historical implications of these issues. This has been spoken by Professor Amy just now on the pronunciation, I won't touch on it. But the question that perhaps can be raised regarding from, uh, arising from urbanization is that um, besides cross-border uh, urbanization, what is happening to the rural areas with urbanization and with domestic internal migration to rural depopulation, what's happening to the, what do you call that, the changing family structures, the value systems and so on, and what about the rural urban divide? Is it a continuum or is it dichotomous? Is it a dichotomy between the two? Now, second point that I raise here is the uneven development and regional divides. I think this has been discussed very seriously early on. But the challenge to, to, for development theory is, is balanced sustainable development possible at all? And if so, how to make it possible? I think Professor Emma just now, I pronounce your name wrong, wrongly, but never mind. I think I, we know who <laughs> I'm referring to you. You have raised that question very aptly. The third point is about rising prosperity, but with high levels of inequality, eloquent presentation by Professor Riggs. I won't go into this. And Malaysia is on record, it's highest Gini coefficient, highest levels of inequality. Yeah, they take pride of growth, but at the same time, they should be ashamed of the high levels of inequality in the country. So implications of inequality, the sociology of inequality is very important. We have been talking about visibility and invisibility of the poor, the migrants, and so on and so forth. And I think this is an area which sociologists can really look into very seriously. The implications of this, the rage of the masses, are we, win are we witnessing the rage of the masses in South Asia today because of the rising inequality? Especially the, produ the produced poor that uh, Professor Riggs talked about this morning. Fourth, and here since this has not been touched, I'll elaborate a bit on the rise of the middle class. Now the rise of the middle class is seen as something very positive, as a force of democratization, as a social equalizer to, to bridge the gaps between the rich and the poor and so on and so forth. But what are the implications of the rise of the middle class on consumption, on sustainable development, on, ecology, on ecological transition? Heavy consumption of energy, cars, air conditions, and so many other things related to, to energy consumption. And at the same time, whilst the middle class is supposed to be a reflection of rising prosperity, but there is an other side of it, that the middle class household debt is increasing. And to quote Malaysia again, since I'm coming from there, 19, 2006, 60%, the, the percentage of household debts has been rising from 69% in 2006 to the present 83% of the GDP, which is very high. And almost half of the monthly income is used to pay debts. That is the situation. So the question here is, sociological question that's very important to investigate, Will many of the middle class households live their lives, the rest of their lives for the bank to pay off bank loans? I think that is a reality that they have to deal with. And in this sense, is the middle class expanding or shrinking? And what about middle class people coming? Sorry, three minutes left. Right. <laughs> Number five, civil and uncivil society. When we talk about the middle class, we always talk about democratization, about civil society, and so on and so forth. Very good. The spaces open up between the state on the one hand and family on the other, that is so we call civil society. But what about the rise of the uncivil society? I think this is a very important question. The uncivil society, the dark forces within this so-called civil society. And members and leaders of this uncivil society the extreme right wing, and the fascist elements within civil society, within within this group, are also members of the middle class, and this is developed happening in Malaysia, Indonesia. I believe it's also in Thailand, in other parts of Southeast Asia, everywhere. So, 
will the question is will the public sphere or spaces opened up between the state and the family always be progressive for change or in fact is a is a stumbling block or a force to oppose change and progress that is i think the first thing next one youth bulge the youth bulge is the youth bulge is very important in southeast asia there you are i will not elaborate but the importance of the youth in elections and so on, definitely cannot be denied, right? But the question is, are the youth agents for change or the guardians of the establishment? They have plenty of energy, so it can be either way. So it depends on the forces that uh, lead them. Last point, vulnerability. People have become vulnerable, more and more vulnerable today due to structural position being at the bottom, the bottom 40 percent because of globalization due to the economic crisis environmental disasters that emma has been talking about life cycle and all, all that right how do we address vulnerability human development undp talk about capability of individuals human security efforts talk about freedom of fear freedom from one and so on and so forth but we need more than this we need more than every individual approach we need more than community approach but we need a more structured analysis a more political economy approach to the question about who owns what and who has power to decide and so on. Now, implications for sociology, two minutes left. Smelser, Neil Smelser talks about the essence of the touchstone of sociology is change, right? And that sociology appears to be underdeveloped because they have not been focusing on change, according to him. I agree with that. The social change is the touchstone of sociology, even for contemporary Southeast Asia. But I think we have got to push the frontiers of discussion on social change to conflicts, contestations, and their outcomes. I mean, from what is happening in the region, we can see that. And the idea of the and direction of change to Southeast Asia is still progress. But what kind of progress are we talking about? Material progress, social progress, human progress. I think these are the, the core issues. And more importantly, <coughs> um, where am I upset here? Now, because sociology of Southeast Asia is concerned with these issues, change, conflicts, contestations, and consequently, subsequently convergence, the theme of this conference, it thus cannot take a value-free position. Rather, it has got to take a public, critical, and committed position to the issues that we study. This means that while sociology has to be academic, to fulfill the academic imperatives, sociology of Southeast Asia also has to take an advocacy position because ideas have consequences for change. On that note, thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Now, let's hear three or four comments. Thank you, Madam. Thank you for all presenters in front. Uh, this morning we are talking all about the inequality. When I when we talk about inequality, I remember what the Gandhi says: "Gold is provide enough for the needy, but not for the greedy." Okay. So the inequality is based on this one. And then the question is like this. We measure inequality with the Gini coefficient. Is there any relation between the Gini coefficient with the democracy or social protest? Because you mentioned, uh, Professor Emma, that the highest Gini coefficient is in Malaysia, and then after that, Philippines and Thailand. Philippines and Thailand already observed that some social unrest. If you know in the Philippines, there is people power. And then in Thailand, there are chief of the people. So the question is, when the Malay 
Indonesia will have his social unrest because he said, no, it's uh, Professor Rembong maybe also can fight about this one. You know, uh, uh, I'm I'm worried about this one. I'm not worried with my country because my country is rather similar to Indonesia in the Gini coefficient. <laughs> it, we have already social unrest about this. <laughs> you know, uh, and then I will end this question with the the uh, uh, study of the Joseph Stiglitz, the Stiglitz Commissions, which is. Uh, launched the report in the two years ago that we cannot just use the GNP as the indicator of the social welfare, but we have to use the so-called happiness index for the, the, the next generation. Thank you so much. Thank you for a few. Uh, in particular, uh, Professor Hank, I have just a remark about what you said. I'm a bit more than skeptical about the lesson that ASEAN can receive from European Union. At the best, maybe ASEAN can know what not to do, but <laughs> receiving some positive lessons, I'm a bit worried about this and we see what is what is going on in Europe with the rise of the different nationalities, how the banking systems created uh, different social national uh, depressions in different countries like in Greece, Spain and maybe Italy in the future for instance. Uh, European Union is not a union. It's <laughs> It's an economic, in a time for maybe economic union, uh, but so far, so many things has to be done, and maybe ASEAN country can give some lesson to European Union in the future. And Professor Mbong and I would say, you didn't mention Gini coefficient, I said, that's your question, that's my question. Then social unrest question, or oh, this is my question, it's both our questions. I think what I'd like to say is that, in a sense, in, in looking at Gini coefficient and social unrest, it, it's so simple. You have to look at all the, in, the mediatory variables that goes into it. And you look at the state and its apparatus of control, which I think Malaysia is master to do much more than the Philippine state. So when you talk about you know, the correlation, you, it, it, there's an intervening variable, which is state strength and how the apparatus, the state apparatus have mastered very much in controlling its population. I think here in the Philippines we make a joke about, yeah, we have people power, we're very free to express everything. But then, you know, the, the, as the leaders will say, you cannot eat freedom. And, and in fact, uh, I remember 20 years ago when uh, Lee Kuan Yew came to the Philippines and said, you must have growth first before democracy. And some people, the leader says, yeah, 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 yeah. But of course us, we says, who are you to lecture us? But, but that, you know, when he said about, you know, this correlation, I think as a, as a region, we have to, we, you know, to think as a region, we also have to first think from our social locations. And what does that mean in terms of the kinds of projects, state projects, national projects that are going on? Now, Professor Rembo. Thank you, thank you uh, for remark and also to Professor Briono who raised a question about the Gini. Well, I think the Gini is out of the box. It's already out. And it comes out in the form of unrest, in terms of the rebellion and all that. And the Gini, <laughs> that is the Gini. Um, I think, yes, you have answered the question. You see, unrest, we have been talking about visibility and invisibility, right? You have visible unrest, masses on the streets and so on and so forth. And that's one form, visible form. But there is also the invisibility of unrest within codes. And I think that's what you see in, in Malaysia and, and it's developing. But Emma has talk, talk, just mentioned about the states. 
the ability to control. And in Malaysia, the use of religion and racism has been fairly effective in trying to, to contain at the moment you know, the kind of feelings of discontent that has been developing in the country. Lately, nevertheless, because of the rising prices, the cut down of subsidies and so on, something almost blew up. But it's con I mean, the state is fairly smart too. I mean, <laughs> it's, it, you have got to give that credit to them that they, they, are, they are quite adaptable in terms of quite quick to respond in order to, uh, what do you call that, damage control or firefighting that kind of situation. But how much they can do that in future is another problem. Because I man did mention about the, the middle class is facing social, economic and financial problems and they are feeling the heat already. And, and I think they are, of course, they are coming up. As you can see in the, what we call the per se movement. Per se is a, is a struggle for free and fair elections in Malaysia. They have acted hundreds of thousands on the streets, but not the way they move in Bangkok or the way they move in Jakarta or, or in Manila is different, but they're fairly controlled, fairly orderly yeah, uh, at the moment. But, but I think this is the force that is growing in the country. Thank, thank you for the question. Actually, uh, had I been given more time by chairperson, chairwoman, <laughs> chair lady, I would actually elaborate on the merits of uh, European Union. Uh, the, <coughs> the question, I mean, the, the, the criticisms of European Union in the, in the sense of its main, the European, uh, sorry, the Euro crisis and so on are very valid. And, but that has less to do with the European Union but more as a crisis of neoliberal economics. And it has actually affected Japan in, in various forms. In the 1997, it has affected Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, the, the Asian financial crisis. And as we know, the, the subprime problem it has affected America and actually the whole world. So this is, we must separate the two issues. But the, that's it, when I mention it as a way to learn, I learned the positive part. Now, the, there are certain things that, Besides the question of bearing nationalism, the European Union has two other big merits. And there are, number one is that you, because of the European Union and its attraction for, the, for other countries, Greece in the 1960s, uh, Portugal and uh, Spain subsequently have made a very smooth transition to democracy. That's one. Second is after the collapse of the of the Soviet uh, sorry of the Soviet Empire or the fall of the Berlin Wall. I was living in Amsterdam, uh, Holland at that time. The, there was angst in Europe, and luckily because of the European Union and the offer of membership, offer of membership that if you do certain thing right, you become members. So I would say. I will argue very strongly that if we look at the European Union, let's look at those aspects too. And in the case of ASEAN, in the case of a, uh, a Southeast Asia, you can, I'm dreaming, in fact, I tend to see that the fact that Myanmar is within ASEAN is better than for Myanmar to be outside ASEAN. Yeah? I tend to argue that there are some opinion, some body, there's a body opinion that says, because Myanmar is doing a good, bad job, it's a dictatorship and so on, it, it should not be a member. I would argue that, yes, uh, if I look at what happens, what happens, <laughs> then I think it's better that the, the Myanmar is willing uh, to be uh, to ASEAN. So, I mean, we, we look at it this way. I, I agree totally with your criticisms of the European Union, but you look at the track record of the European Union, the beside bearing nationalism at the level of ideas, uh, and this is a big challenge for many countries of the world. Thank you. Thanks for a lively, rich discussion, and we have to end the session now. And thanks again to Professor Porio, Professor Ambong, and Professor Heng.
we'll have more discussion during the coffee break. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. I would like Ajahn Chiyan to give a token of appreciation to all the speakers. By panel, so um, maybe you can remain for a few minutes for the announcement later. Presenter of uh, Panel 43, ASEAN Community uh, Democracy and Values. This panel in room 7704 in the afternoon will be moved. It will be it will be moved and combined with Panel 3030 in the morning. So for those of you who are looking for the panel 43 in the afternoon, there will be no such panel because it's going to be moved, merged with panel 3-0 in the morning, in the same room, uh, in, in the room uh, 7705. And uh, for those of you who want a certificate as, a, as an evidence of attending this uh, international conference, uh, you, you will be given upon request. So it is not going to give out to all, only those who interest. And um, another, another announcement is about um, uh, the lunch for today. You, there is no need for a coupon for lunch today. Just present your name tag and that, uh, and that's. Oh, another, uh, another announcement from EFSA the Asia Pacific Sociological Association. For those who are interested to become a members of EPSA, <laughs> you, can, you can register with um, uh, the EPSA desk, registration desk uh, downstairs at the ground floor. The treasures of uh, EPSA will be uh, welcoming you to become a member. Thank you very much.